helping the world around companies and businesses. He is an advisor to companies like General Electric, Pepsi, Ford, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He arrived very early this morning, uh, not yet feeling the jet lag. Uh, please welcome Mike Arouge. Very, very glad to be here. Um, I did get in this morning. And um, I work at a company called Undercurrent. We are an organizational design and transformation firm based in New York City. Um, and, and the perspective that I'm coming at this from is essentially to say, when you look at what digital technology enables, um, how, do, how do organizations need to adapt in order to be able to take advantage of everything that it has to offer? So first, I think it's important to realize that we, we live in a world that is now defined by exponential change and inescapable complexity. In a, exponential change and inescapable complexity. And to help us wrap our heads around what exponential really means, um, there's a great anecdote that I, I got from, from a uh, terrific book called The Second Machine Age by Andrew McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson. And the story goes like this. Um, hundreds of years ago in uh, India, a, a farmer invented the game chess. And the king at the time loved this game so much, and he invited the farmer to, to come, come to his palace and the king said, this is a fantastic game that you've invented, and I'd like to reward you for it in some way. So what can I, what can I give you to repay you? And the humble farmer said, you know what, I really just need food for my family, so why don't you just pay me in rice, and I'll, what we'll do is we'll put one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard, two grains of rice on the second square, four grains of rice on the next square, eight grains of rice on the next, and so on, exponential, right? And and so the numbers get really, really big, really fast. Um, and, and by the halfway through the chessboard, you're already up into the trillions of grains of rice. But what's really, really crazy is that in the second half of the chessboard, the numbers get completely unfathomable. By the 64th square of the chessboard, the king is promising the inventor over 18 quintillion grains of rice, which is more grains of rice than have ever been made in the history of man. That's how many grains of rice it is. So that's, that is exponential change. And so what does this mean now for, in a, in a business context? What, what does that mean for business and, and for innovation? So on the, on the left there is a very, very early version of the MakerBot, which is a, a consumer grade 3D printer. The MakerBot was created by a guy named Brie Pettis um, in a hacker garage in Brooklyn called uh, NYC Resistor. And when the, they were tinkering, playing around with things, it's about five or six, five or six years ago, and, uh, and they, the group wanted a 3D printer, but they couldn't afford one because the only 3D printers that were available at the time were huge and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so what they decided to do was make their own. And they, they dug up some expired patents, they, they open sourced their own design process and their own um, engineering uh, designs, invited a global community um, to contribute and to iterate on the design that they were making together. And four years later, they were purchased for $400 million um, by Stratasys, which is one of the biggest uh, 3D print, printer manufacturers in the world. Uh, and, and I always laugh when I, when I think about this because if, if Stratasys had, had been a little bit wiser, they would have just invited Bree to come and work for them and given the, the hacker collective one of their printers for free and saved themselves $399 million. Uh, but that MakerBot is, isn't alone, right? You, you look at something like WhatsApp, the mobile messaging app, right? In, it was founded in 2009. In 2014, just five years later, it was sold to Facebook for $19 billion. And, and some examples that are, that are really uh, you know, near and dear to Ericsson's are, you go, you go back to um, the, the phone network, for instance, talking about that a little bit earlier. It took 89 years to connect 150 million phone users. But it took Facebook 
just eight years to reach one, to connect one billion Facebook users. And it took Android just five years to get to one billion users. So that's, that's how quickly things are changing now. So it's never been easier to bring an idea to life or to, to bring it to scale. And what's driving this? These are the, these are the three, I, I would argue that these are the three most fundamental um, drivers behind this, this evolution that we're seeing. Number one is, is Moore's Law. So Moore's Law says that the amount of computing power you can fit on a computer chip doubles roughly every 18 months. And now I want you all to remember that chessboard. So Moore's Law started around 1958 and, and has been holding true since then. So every 18 months, um, computing power has roughly doubled um, since 1958. We crossed over into the second half of the chessboard when it comes to Moore's Law in 2006. So it's not an accident that we're suddenly starting to see these huge leaps forward in technology. Look at something like mobile computing, and the iPhone comes out in 2007, right? Or the um, Internet of Things, or robotics, or artificial intelligence that we're starting to see these big leaps forward in. It's not an accident that those things are starting to happen more frequently and that the leaps are getting bigger and bigger. That's going to happen more and more over the years um, and decades to come. The second uh, key driver is platforms. And this is really about platforms, that, platforms for technology and also platforms for knowledge that are enabling this, this gigantic wave of recombinant innovation where people are, are it's, getting easier and easier to build on each other's ideas and to create new things um, out of existing infrastructure. You know, some really great and powerful platforms that, that, uh, that touch so many aspects of our lives right now are things like GPS, um, or look at iOS and Android as, as operating system uh, platforms. Look at something like Amazon Web Services and how huge and robust that is, how easy it makes, uh, makes it for new uh, web startups to get off the ground. And the third piece here is networks. So th this is going to be a major theme for, for the next day or two, but we've never been more connected. People connected to other people, people connected to machines, and machines connected to other machines. As, as Ericsson is, is predicting, we, we may see over, uh, over 50 billion connected devices by uh, 2020. So when you put those three things together, it creates this very, very volatile environment. Um, two, two companies that spring to mind that, that seem to be getting it and, and uh, succeeding very well in this environment, Uber and Tesla. So Uber, for now, is an application that allows you to call a taxi and, and gets you where you want to go. I would encourage you to think, think of Uber much broader than that. Really what Uber is creating is a is a logistics platform for getting anything you want from point A to point B in the most efficient and, and, uh, and economically uh, efficient way possible. So if I was at UPS or, or FedEx, I would be paying very close attention to what Uber is doing right now. And Uber has created this incredibly valuable uh, business grown at tremendous scale by actually building a, a relatively thin layer of user experience on top of a very robust stack of pre-existing technologies. Again, GPS, they didn't have to invent that. They didn't have to invent the iPhone. They didn't have to invent um, you know, the, the connectivity between, between cars. All of these pieces of, of, of the puzzle were already in place for them. Uh, the other really good example is Tesla. Tesla, I would argue, is one of the most, not, not only most interesting innovative companies right now, but also one of the most interesting strategic companies right now. And some of the pieces that, are, that, are, that Tesla is starting to put in place um, go far beyond just the car. Um, so, so for instance, um, you know, Elon Musk, the, the, um, the head of Tesla, is also the head of a solar energy company called Solar City. Um, and and he, he, they made a lot of news earlier this year, Tesla made a lot of news earlier this year, when they announced that they were sharing, opening up a whole bunch of their patents. The patents that they were opening up were primarily focused on the charging stations. 
Um, and this is obviously to incent other uh, car companies who are getting into the electric vehicle market to use um, Tesla's uh, you know, engineering and specs for, the, for that connectivity. So that's going to spur a, a wider adoption of their, of, of their network of charging stations all over the US and, and eventually all over the world. You layer on top of that um, solar energy, so, so solar power technology um, is also increasing at this, at this exponential pace. And before you know it, Tesla is, is owning and operating, and Solar City is owning and operating, a nationwide uh, distributed power network um, that is fueling all of the cars on, on the road and probably putting energy back into the, uh, the power grid. Um, so really, really interesting uh, moves that connect so many different uh, pieces. So, so this is what the market looks like now. And back in, you know, in the late 50s, uh, it's interesting, by the way, that this, this timeline uh, maps to how long Moore's Law has been, uh, has been in effect. But in the late 50s, the average lifespan of a company on the S&P 500 was over 60 years. And today, the average lifespan is around 18 years. So it's, you have to, companies are being forced to adapt and change quicker than ever. And at the same time, they're facing this incredible complexity, right? Imagine, for instance, if you were the, if you were the head of the World Health Organization right now, and you're trying to think about how do you, how do you bring together as so many different um, agencies and governments and actors to fight something like the Ebola epidemic. It's, it's so complex that, uh, that any single human being can't possibly hold it all in their, in their head. And so we've been looking at this, and, and one of the things that, that is interesting to us is that there are actually systems out there that are very good at both being complex and large, but also being very adaptive. Um, able to change very quickly. And scientists um, have a name for these kinds of systems. They're called complex adaptive systems. Some classic examples of them, the ant colony. You have tens of thousands of ants without any top-down um, authority telling them what to do. The only thing that's telling them what to do is the DNA that's programmed into them. And yet they create these very, very sophisticated um, you know, arrangements, uh, designs for how they live and how they work. Um, and and these, uh, these, these colonies can survive for decades and pass on all kinds of, uh, all kinds of knowledge um, down through the generations. That's another example is our immune system. So every day our, our lymph nodes produce about 10 million lymphocytes that go out into our body and try to find matches, try to find um, some, some kind of uh, illness for which they are a match. And every once in a while, a few of them come back up to the lymph node and say, I, I found a match, and if the signal is strong enough, the lymph node starts re replicating that one, and they go out and they fight the, fight the pathogen. Um, and lastly, the, the internet, really, really classic example. Um, incredibly complex, um, very, very little, if any, centralization, um, and incredibly resilient. It's, it's nearly impossible um, to, to control it or to or to um, you know, put any limits on, you shut down one piece of it, another piece uh, still stays up. Very, very resilient systems, and the internet has enabled and created so many complex and, and powerful, valuable things in our world. And so we're, we're looking at these complex adaptive systems from, from a kind of scientific and, and academic perspective, but then we're also looking at this new, this this new uh, generation of companies, of businesses, um, that, that are thriving in, in this incredibly um, challenging um, climate. You know, not just companies like Tesla and Uber, companies like Google and Amazon, companies like Facebook, um, Netflix. They, and when we look closely at how they operate, We've, we've learned that they, they are operating in a fundamentally different way that actually looks a lot like the complex adaptive systems we see out in nature and, and in these other uh, environments. And so we've narrowed it down for now. We, we've identified seven key shifts 
that, that distinguish how to operate in this, in this new way that any business, any organization um, can use to change how they operate and to make themselves more adaptive. First one is about embracing uncertainty. 100% certainty is a fantasy. <laughs> and, and the longer your plans are, the more wrong they're likely to be. So, so what companies are doing that are really good at this um, are finding ways to learn faster. Amazon has created something called Amazon Web Lab that enables uh, people who are working on the Amazon.com product to, to run live experiments on the actual site all the time. Last year they ran over 2,000 experiments. And those experiments <coughs> allow them to test and learn um, new features, new, new products, and new services to build into the, the platform. Netflix uh, does something really interesting. They, they have this thing called Chaos Monkeys. Chaos Monkeys are this, are this kind of software engineering um, hack where a Chaos Monkey will, will throw a very, very challenging problem into the system. And the, the engineers who are working on the Netflix uh, product um, don't know when they're going to come, don't know what's going to, what they're going to be. Um, but they will they'll create these very, very hard to predict um, you know, uh, kind of circumstances that, they, that the product and that the engineers will be forced to deal with. So let's imagine that for some random reason, everybody in the world wants to watch Bridget Jones's Diary tonight at, at 9 p.m. That, that's very, very hard for Netflix to, to predict or imagine, and, and yet the, the system ideally would be able to, what, what, what happens if it needed to do that? Um, and, and so that forces the engineers to be really creative and come up with a really creative solutions to make sure that the, that the platform and the product is extremely resilient. Number two is about serving networks. So, so many of the companies we see today um, take advantage of, of a basic principle called the network effect, which says that for every additional user you add to the system, the system gets better for everyone. We were just talking about this, this earlier. Um, YouTube is a, is a great example. The more people who, who view uh, YouTube, the more people who add videos to it, the better it gets for everybody. Um, Facebook, another example. And someone like uh, Airbnb, when you're thinking about um, you know, the, the lodging industry, um, the hotel, the hotel uh, model is very binary, right? There are people who have hotels, who own hotels, who operate them, and then there are the people who stay in them. But Airbnb looked at it from a very fresh perspective and said, why are those, those are not necessarily two different people, right? People who, who are going to visit places might also be the people who have places that other people would like to visit. Uh, so, so thinking about how you can design for networks and, and kind of build that into your process from, from the beginning is really, really critical. Third one, distribute authority. So this one is about pushing autonomy, pushing authority out to the edges, enabling teams who are closest to customers, closest to the user, um, to, to experiment and to turn the insights that they're getting into action. Um, two companies that, that do this really well, one does it in a very radical way, it's a company called Valve. It's one of the most successful video game companies in the world. There are two rules um, for every employee when they join Valve. One is find something to do, and the second is go find more people like yourself to come and work here. Um, every desk at Valve has wheels on it, and you are encouraged to pick it up and move it to a team, move it to a project that you feel compelled to work on. Um, that works especially well in something like the video game industry, which is fueled by these big hits, right? So you don't, it's very hard to predict what, what's going to be a big hit. Um, so you want to encourage um, some variation. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, another example is Spotify, um, you know, a, a, a Sweden-based um, company. And they, the way that they, their entire org structure is set up is set up to enable multidisciplinary uh, teams that combine all the necessary uh, skills, uh, you know, back-end, front-end engineering, uh, design, UX, data analytics, whatever it may be, and that group owns a very, very particular slice of the product. So maybe I'm within the, within the desktop app um, 
product team and my, my working team is focused on playlists, for instance. And we have complete authority over however we want to make that better. It's, it's up to us and we don't have to ask anybody else for, permit, for permission. Next one is promoting simplicity. So how can you use relatively simple but um, broad uh, rule, rule systems to guide an organization? Um, Google's mission statement is actually a really powerful one. Their, their stated mission for, since, for pretty much since they were founded is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. So that, that one thing guides so many decisions and they can trust people to go off and experiment knowing that they're still working towards that shared purpose. Um, Nordstrom actually has one that I really, really love. Their, their manual when you, when you get it, Nordstrom is a retail uh, brand in, in the US. Um, their, their one rule for everybody when they arrive is use good judgment in all situations. That's it. We don't have to say anything more than that. Trust your people. Um, next one, process information. So this is about working in public and defaulting to open. We don't know what information is going to be useful. And with, a, with all the information and the data that is created now from all the kinds of things that we can interact with, um, the easier you make it for other people to, to access and learn from the information that, that is being generated, the better. Um, Amazon, one of, the, one of the things that has made them so powerful is very, very early on, Jeff Bezos, their CEO, um, basically decreed that all, all uh, collaboration between different parts of the product team had to, had, to be, had to occur via APIs coded into the software. So if I'm someone who, who works on you know, the, the front page of the electronics section on Amazon.com um, and I want to speak to the, you know, I want to do something with the recommendation engine, um, there's an API that I call to pull that in and that's the only way that anything speaks to anything else. So you're hard coding information sharing and information access into, into the entire uh, system. Um, but this also can happen on a, on a very kind of day-by-day uh, -day working team basis, too. It can be something as simple as a shared task management tool. We, we've become big fans of a tool called Trello recently, T-R-E-L-L-O. It's a very simple, lightweight uh, task management tool. And when you're working team, uh, everyone puts their tasks into there with your name on it, and you revisit it every week, and everybody can see what each other is responsible for, Everybody can see the, the progress being made in a very transparent way. Um, and that makes it easier for people to, to take action and to, and to be uh, proactive. Next one, encourage divergence. This is about that, that critical ingredient of variation. Um, how, do you, how do you create spaces where you can try as many different things because you don't know uh, what's going to be the best thing? Um, Google, uh, Google X, their, their offshoot, um, you know, big bet, uh, kind of breakthrough innovation um, group is a good example of this. They created a very special space for it. And they weren't the first ones to do, to do something like this. Um, back in the day, uh, Xerox Park, uh, really, really uh, famous example of this kind of, uh, you know, enabling divergent uh, thinking. Um, but creating some kind of safe space where it's okay to, to take big risks and to, and, to, and to experiment and to learn new things is really, really critical. And enabling crossover. So, so at the same time that you want to try as many different things as possible, you also then need a mechanism to identify and select the things that work best. And 